Disability Sports Australia are proud to present the Breaking Disability podcast series with elite athletes from Australia, from the past, the present and the future of our sport and recreation standpoint. We're excited to be able to start this with our most famous and rewarded Paralympic athlete of all time, Louise Sauvage. You'll hear Louise talk about how she started out in sport, how sport changed her life just at the age of three when her parents chose to take her to swimming lessons, how she then went on to try wheelchair sports at the age of eight and then start to compete in wheelchair basketball before finding her love of the track. Louise has won nine Paralympic gold medals and four Paralympic silver medals. She's in the Sport Australia Hall of Fame and recently, in 2019, got put into legendary status as the first Paralympic athlete. Louise also lit the cauldron at the Sydney 2000 Paralympic Games and carried the flag of Australia into the opening ceremony of the Athens 2004 Paralympic Games. We're so pleased to be able to have Louise as our ambassador and have her as our first guest of starting Breaking Disability, the podcast. Uh, I am pleased to present our first ever disability um, podcast called Breaking Disability uh, with our special guest, Louise Savage, who is a uh, such a well-known Paralympic athlete, uh, and we'll talk about her accomplishments in a minute. But uh, Louise, thanks so much for joining us on Breaking Disability um, and being the first guest uh, in our podcast series. Thank you, and thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, um, look, let's start off with uh, some of your amazing achievements. Uh, as I just said to Louise before the recording started, if uh, we went through everything that she'd done, uh, we would be here for about three hours. So <laughs> we'll condense it a little bit. But um, obviously, we're in the midst of Olympic Games uh, in Tokyo at the moment. Um, and uh, you have won nine Paralympic gold medals and four Paralympic silver medals. Um, and you've also won two Olympic medals and a bronze Olympic medal as well. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, that. Um, I'm interested, especially as in there's been a lot of discussion about Paralympics and Olympics um, actually merging and becoming one event. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question and something that a lot of people actually do ask me. Um, in my personal opinion, I, I think we should be separate. Um, I feel like we we deserve our own time in the sun, I suppose, and, and able to shine on our own. Um, I think we get overshadowed by the able-bodied athletes, unfortunately, a fair bit. Um, so it's nice when it's just the Paralympics and you can really see what our Aussie athletes are doing Um so, yeah, that's just my personal opinion. I think logistically also I think it would be extremely difficult to, to have both games at the same time. There's just way too many athletes and the venues I'm sure wouldn't be able to cope either. But, um, but, but the thought of being together as one team is, is exciting and it would be really cool to, to see that happen. But I'm not sure it'll, it'll ever go ahead, unfortunately. Um, the reason why I've actually been able to compete in the Olympic Games is actually in a demonstration event. So um, those those were demonstration events that didn't actually count on the medal tally. So um, I just think it was a great way of promoting Paralympic sport and what was to come. Um, I know I'm totally biased, but, you know, I, I kind of call the Olympics the test event. And then, of course, we have the main event, which is the Paralympics. So um, we're learning a lot right now from the Olympics. And we'll, <laughs> sure we'll, be in the, <laughs> we'll be in the Paralympics very soon. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And, and obviously, uh, you know, we're in the midst of lockdown in, in Sydney due to COVID-19. Um, real challenge uh, in preparation for our athletes. We'll talk more about that later in the games. But, you know, just from that mental toughness point of view, having won nine Paralympic gold medals, um, you know, having to establish yourself as an athlete, can you tell us a little bit about how you approached um, your events and, and the pressure that was on you, especially, obviously, in Sydney um, after being so successful in Atlanta and Barcelona? Um, how did that affect you and how did you prepare uh, to be successful in Sydney? 
Yeah, Sydney was probably, as you mentioned, the most pressure put on me. Um, I got to the point where people were saying to me, oh, I don't need to wish you luck. You'll, you'll, you'll be fine. And I'm like, no, no, I'll take it. Um, but, um, yeah, it was very stressful. I think being a home games and you were expected to win. And then, of course, my first race in the Paralympics, I didn't win. <laughs> and it was quite controversial in the 800. So, um, it was very stressful. I had not experienced anything like that before and kind of going outside the village was amazing. And just, But in the same respect, when I look back at it now, obviously not at the time, I, I felt very stressed out and I, I was thankful for the team around me. But when I think about it now, I just think, wow, look how far we came. All these people knew who I was and they knew my event and, and that is mind-blowing and fantastic. And, you know, I'm totally biased when it comes to Sydney that I think we really, you know, did such a good job and turned the Paralympics around and, and how it should be portrayed and the respect that the athletes should have. And I think it's carried on from, from Sydney definitely. Unfortunately, four years prior to that, in Atlanta, it was it was not the case. So, you know, knowing that we were going to have the home games, um, yeah, I was so proud and, and so happy and and that we could do a good job. But for me to prepare mentally, it was just, um, yeah, I did a lot of work with a sports psychologist, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how important is that? I mean, you know, we, we put so much pressure on our athletes and I think two amazing stories to come out of the current Tokyo uh, Games are uh, Kate Campbell and Emily Seabom. Um, you know, they've uh, been through it and, and gone through some pretty dark times in their swimming career, but actually, you know, won gold medals in the relays and along the way and, and people kind of focus on maybe what they haven't done or haven't been successful this time. It was so good to be able to see athletes like them who have been through multiple Paralympics and had so much pressure on them um, actually just perform and enjoy their journey. And you can see the mentoring part um, that, that they've given, you know, to Emma and Kaylee and, and the other athletes who were so successful coming through. Can you tell us a little bit about that mentoring component um, as a mentor in the team and as someone coming through, how that was important to you? Yeah, I think it's it's extremely important to show, um, you know, what is possible, but also to share your knowledge and your advice. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because now I'm a coach and I've been to a number of Paralympics as a coach, but all these athletes know that I've been there and done that and it's it's so it's a weird communication that we have that I don't necessarily have to um, they don't have to explain themselves because they know they know that I know so it's 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 really awesome to have that kind of connection um, I think it's really important for the for the younger ones to to really see and, and show you know they're coming through they're making their debuts and you know they've got other athletes there that they can rely on and ask questions about and of course uh, you know our staff a lot of our staff are, are ex athletes and yeah have a wealth of knowledge so it is it is very important to have that generational gap through through the Paralympic Games. Now. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about what I would assume is two highlights for you in your Paralympic career, uh, one being able to light the cauldron in Sydney and then um, two being able to carry the flag in, into Athens. Um, tell us a little bit about those two experiences for you. Um, you know, we just saw obviously um, uh, the tennis player um, Naomi Osaka, you know, light the cauldron and, and all of the things that she'd been through in her uh, career leading up through this, um, through Wimbledon, the French Open. You know, how much pressure we obviously saw Kathy um, as well in the in the Sydney um, Olympics do this. Tell us about your journey here um, and and how you know amazing that would have felt to do. Well. To go back a little further, four years earlier, I was at the closing ceremony and obviously the opening ceremony in Atlanta, and a friend of mine was carrying the torch into the stadium, and I thought, wow, wouldn't that be an awesome thing to do? <laughs> um, and then, of course, four years later, uh, <laughs> there um, you are. <laughs> I, yeah, I had that opportunity. Um, we only got told about um, three or four days prior to the opening ceremony that um, I was to be one of the last six torchbearers, and we all met to do rehearsals at the stadium. It was all hush hush and top secret, and. Um, we were all very, very excited and, of course, they told us, you know, what was going to happen and then, you know, they said to us, well, don't you want to know who's going to light it? And I think we were all beside ourselves with excitement that we're actually getting to do it. But then they did announce that that I was I was going to light the actual cauldron and, yeah, it's a massive honour and just, you know, I couldn't ask for more and it was just phenomenal. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone and I, I remember um, actually on the night, uh, you know, obviously I was 
whisked away after we uh, we marched out and uh, got ready for the for the job that I had to do, and that was to light. And um, my family were up in the stands, and of course back then we had the handy cam and we were videoing. And you can see, you can hear my mother in the background, and she says, "Oh, there's Louise." Oh, the cheeky bugger. She didn't tell me she was doing that. <laughs> so it was, a bit of a, it was a bit of a surprise for everyone, which was fantastic. And, yeah, it was, yeah, definitely a moment that I didn't want to screw up. <laughs> but um, it <laughs> was pressure, it all, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. We saw what happened with Cathy. I thought, oh, yeah. gosh. But, um, yeah, no, it was fantastic and it was, a, it was a great experience. And, obviously, Sydney was one of the biggest moments in my career, not only for myself um, and my personal achievements, but all the other things that happened around it and just the way the, you know, Australia embraced us. NDSP Plan Managers are your NDIS Plan Management Specialist and are proud to support Disability Sports Australia in getting more people with a disability involved in all levels of sport. Choose a plan manager that will help you achieve your goals at ndsp.com.au. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, uh, or before we get to that, um, what about carrying the flag in in, in, Atlanta, in um, Athens? Yeah, Athens was my last Paralympic Games as an athlete and um, I was given the honour of carrying the flag in and that was amazing as well, you know, to lead the Australian team out. Um, again, an extremely proud moment. Um, my family were on the other side of, of the team the stadium and we didn't get to march all the way around so they were extremely disappointed but uh but yeah we've got some good photos so it's all good but uh, <laughs> but yeah it was it was another moment i suppose in my career that was just you know phenomenal and let's talk about um the pressure of sydney where you're still you know the, the number one athlete in the world really and, and the expectation was so high um and then atlanta did you know that that was going to be your last paralympic games before you went in Athens, yes. Oh, sorry, um, Athens, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did know it was going to be my last Games. Um, about oh, eight or nine months prior to the Games, I didn't know whether I was actually going to make the Games at all. Um, a number of injuries and just the repetitive nature of my sport and the position that we're in in the race chairs. I had a lot of impingements. Uh, my hands were going numb and and a few other things that were just, you know, niggling and just continuously. And they, they didn't know whether I could push through all that. But, you know, I had a, lot, a bit of time to... Um, make that decision and then with my coach and my support team uh, we did decide that we would you know try and do our very very best and minimal training um, just enough to get through and to be able to be at the best I could and and still be able to perform so yeah I did know it was going to be my last Paralympics and it's, it's kind of strange when you think about it because I remember warming up for my last event and there was one of the Canadian coaches and I said well that's my last warm-up and he's like what? What do you mean? I said, no, no, that's the last one. <laughs> so um, it was kind of awesome, you know, to know that that was it. But, you know, you know, I got two silvers and I was, I was really happy with that and a PB and, yeah, I couldn't ask for more. You know, I performed the best I possibly could given my situation in, in Athens. Um, so, you know, an amazing Paralympic career, um, one of the best of all times. Um, should be so proud of everything you've done. I'm sure you are. You you released an autobiography, um, your story. Tell me about that journey of writing about everything that's that's happened in your life and and how that kind of felt to be able to you know, pour that out to everybody. Well, it was definitely a journey. I can tell you that now. <laughs> um, we actually did the book. Um, Ian Heads and I did the book. Um, mostly Ian, I'm going to say, because he's the professional there. Uh, he did the book um, prior to 2000. So it was a very, as, as you mentioned before, a very stressful time, a lot going on. And it was probably actually quite relaxing to 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 do the book with Ian at the time, even though my time and, you know, my, um, I was very tired at the at that time as well, but it was actually probably cathartic more than anything. And then eventually when it was all said and done and, and going through the book multiple times before publishing, um, it is a is is a big journey. I can tell you that now, and yeah, it takes a lot of time. And I probably won't do it again. But <laughs> uh, but you know, Ian was fantastic, ever professional, and yeah, we've stayed friends ever since. So it's um yeah, it was great to put something in a book and and have a, a record. And you know, I'm very proud of the book as well. Yeah, it's great. And look, you've been an advocate um, for disability um, all through your career. And I think um, let's go back a little bit. So we'll start uh, in in uh, 
little Louise in uh, in oh, WA. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, your mother uh, English and, and your dad from the Seychelles. And um, and tell me about that journey. And and you know, you're in WA. It's 1973. Um, you're born with a spinal cord um, condition, um, curvature of the spine. Um, I was interested to see that um, your parents enrolled you in swim lessons at the age of three uh, to be able to build your strength up. And around that same time, actually, you were the telethon um, girl uh, in WA. For those of you yes. who don't know, telethons, <laughs> they were a staple uh, as Louise and I are children. We, I think there's only uh, 363 days between us in age, Louise. So um, we, we definitely come from the same era. I am older, so that's that's unfortunate. <laughs> but um, it, it, you know, telephones were a big deal back then. Um, tell me about that journey as a child in WA. Yes, um, you've just mentioned a, a bunch of things. Obviously, um, I was born with my disability, and uh, my parents did enrol me in swimming to build up my upper body strength. But it was a it was a learning curve, not only for myself, learning and a very important and vital skill that I think most children should try and learn to swim, but um, I was with a, a bunch of other children who had similar disabilities and, and of course, my parents got to mingle with their parents and, and it's a bit big learning curve for both of them. So it was really fantastic to be, you know, involved in, in learning. And then um, I didn't actually get involved in wheelchair sports till I was about eight years old um, and that was a bit of a chance learning as well. Um, I was the only child with a, a disability at my primary school. I just went to my local school, the same as my sister, and they were fantastic. They, they were very accessible and very accommodating to my needs. Um, and, you know, I tried. they included me as much as they could in sport and I tried to participate as much as I could as well. But, you know, I think for any child with a disability, you're obviously different and you, you can't compete on the same level, which is um, unfortunate. And, you know, if anyone knows me, I'm just slightly competitive. Um, <laughs> So it wasn't until I was about eight or nine years old that I got introduced to, to wheelchair sports and I was invited to come and try a day. And that's where the window of opportunity and I think my life turned around. Um, you know, I was in this situation where there were so many other children with similar disabilities to myself and it was fantastic. And, yeah, I could compete on an equal level. And from those beginnings, I suppose, then I started representing at junior nationals for my state and, Yep, it's uh, never stopped really. <laughs> <laughs> Variety Activate Inclusion Sports Days are an essential part of what Disability Sports Australia deliver as a program in schools to kids with a physical, sensory or intellectual disability. Thanks Variety for all of your support. So it's, it's interesting, you know, because we, we talk about this story a lot to parents and, and to participants and um, obviously Disability Sports Australia run the Activate Inclusion Sports Days around the country um, with Variety of the Children's Charity and, you know, this program's gone national now. So for parents watching this and thinking about sending their kids to a day where they can, you know, just engage and be in the right environments with some adaptions and, um, you know, how important is that opportunity just to be able to get started and, and you talked about parents talking to each other and I think that's another part of it, isn't it, is that, you know, parents... Parents um, sometimes are a bit overwhelmed with diagnosis. Um, I think you, you, I read you had 20-odd operations before the age of 10. Um, and so, you know, in that case, you know, parents are really overwhelmed and, and it's great just to be able to talk to somebody else in that, in that situation, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been to a few come and try days that have been run around the country and for the kids not to feel different for once, um, to be in an environment where everyone's the same. And as you said, the parents, but even for the children to see someone older in a wheelchair and to, you know, to know that they do the same things that that they are doing right now and, and how do they cope with that when they're older or teenagers, you know, everyone, teenagers are awkward. Sometimes they get embarrassed by things, but then, they see someone older and they see someone that they can, you know, think, oh, well, you know, that person, you see it, you can do it kind of thing. It's definitely there. And, and I think it's, again, for the parents, it's very important. I mean, even for me to talk to a lot of the parents and, you know, they can see a future for their children. Um, there's so many different disabilities out there, but, you know, the sharing of knowledge and information, I mean, I'm, I'm still learning every day. There's there's lots of, you know, little hacks here and there and, and technology that comes along and, 
you know, I don't know all about it, but I get told lots of things, which is fantastic and new products and all kinds of things. And it's it's great to be able to have that community, I think, more than anything and to be able to share information. And, yeah, it's it's brilliant. And uh, I think it's, you know, for the people that really shy away from, from becoming involved, um, you're missing out. No, you're definitely missing out. It's, it's, it's a great community to become involved with. It's interesting your comments there because... Um, going to, you know, mainstream schools. Uh, and I have to ask about Hollywood High School. That's pretty uh, interesting. <laughs> I saw that and thought, yeah, that's appropriate. <laughs> Tell me about Hollywood High School and the days at Hollywood High. <laughs> it's actually a suburb. <laughs> um, it's in uh, WA in, in Netherlands there. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. They've pulled down my school. It's now oh, a housing estate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah, it was a massive school Um I, I went there. I couldn't go to the same high school that my sister went to because it wasn't accessible. Um, and I could go to Hollywood. It was an extremely large school, um, uh, very numbers-wise it was massive. And I had the opportunity to catch a school bus there and back and they were specifically had um, – facilities and access uh, for for kids with different disabilities, which is fantastic. But we were totally in a mainstream school. And I think that was really important too. Um, you know, have I think for the other kids as well, you know, growing up with, you know, other children in, in their classrooms with disabilities, then they're exposed to it and they grow up and they don't see it as something really, really different, um, which I think is fantastic um, more than anything. You know, they're, oh, yeah, no, I had a kid in my school and they had cerebral palsy or they used a wheelchair or they were nonverbal. So, you know, they they get to know that there's different people out there and they still communicated with them. They still had a great time and became friends. So, and, yeah, it's just part of school. One of the great things I just love about what you just talked about was that we've started inviting, you know, school captains or um, uh, prefix into our Activate Inclusion Days um, and they come along with the students who have a disability and then they go back to the school and they actually talk about adaptions in the playground uh, to get them more involved and, and it's just worked really well. And the kids um, from the mainstream part of the school um, are so enthusiastic to be able to help and assist when they get back to school and, and make things better um, and involve those students more. And it's really great to see just the enthusiasm, you know, in those settings. Schools can obviously be pretty hard times for, for kids with disability or any, any child that's any bit different. Um, and kids, as you said, if they don't understand, that's even worse, right, because um, then they're just assuming. So to have somebody who they can talk to and understand disability is much better is, is really important. So um, I think that's a really good point that you made. And, and programs like the Activate Inclusion Program and Come and Try and, and things that Paralympics Australia are doing with the education program have been really successful. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, I know this is quite rife in schools, but, you know, a lot of kids with disabilities or any kids really, any kind of difference you have, you, you seem to get bullied, unfortunately. Um, so I think the greater understanding and, and that that people have of, you know, any difference that you have is is you know, the most important thing than anything. So um, I think education goes a long way on so many different levels to making us accept everybody for who they are. And one thing that I, I want more than anything is for people to see people. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the big message, isn't it? Is It doesn't matter what kind of disability you have, you're a person first um, and you should be treated as a person first uh, and then the adaption comes after that, right? So that's an absolutely. important thing to talk about. Um you, so you talked about PE and trying to, you know, um, be active in school. You know, when we started our Activate Inclusion program a long time ago, five years ago, um, it was only about 28% of kids with a disability that were actually competing and active in PE in schools. Um, and I think that's an important thing to talk about with you, um, especially, you know, with your work with the um, Institute of Sport now um, and, and coaching. What do you think is the things that we could do to close that gap? Uh, and we have closed the gap. There's definitely um, been a significant increase now in, in people, in kids with disabilities um, participating in PE in schools. But, you know, the we have to make it easy for schools, right? We have to make it easier for PE teachers to be able to take an adaption um, of a game off the shelf 
which is a one pager and just be able to implement it into their uh, mainstream PE curriculum um, without giving them a, you know, 50 page manual to read on every part of disability that they could possibly do and be overwhelming. What are some of the things that you think uh, could work really well in just making mainstream PE in schools a bit more adaptive? I think that's probably one of the tough ones, definitely. Um, like you said, you know, schools often have limited resources, limited time um, and facilities as well. Like obviously a, a school oval is not going to work for someone in a chair um, and also someone who struggles to work on a walk on an even ground and things like that. So, there's, you know, like you said, there's so many different disabilities out there. Um, I think it's it's going to be difficult, definitely, but I think they can at least have something every year and every um, semester for their their kids with disabilities and trying to adapt. Um, it is a very difficult thing to do. I'm not sure I have the total answer there, but um, <laughs> but I feel like it's um, the teachers are just like us, like coaches, where they have to think outside the square, and it might probably makes them a better teacher too. How can they make this happen? How can they make it? But also talking to the the student, you know, what do you think? How can we do this? And giving them a little bit more um, ownership too, and involving them in the decisions as well. You know, what can you do? What do you think you can do? You know, how do you think we can make this work with you? I want you to be part of this. So I think it's it's really cool to, to have the, the, the conversation more than anything. Um, I feel like that's taken out of the, the loop a lot. And, and unfortunately, people, like you've said just before, you know, people assume and I, I hate that more than anything. <laughs> Coloplasts have made countless lives easier for the last 65 years. With their range of intermittent catheters, collecting devices, and transanal irrigation systems, Coloplast allows you more time to focus on the things you enjoy in life and less time on your continent's needs. Free NDIS support, nursing services, and personalized support are just the beginning with Coloplast. Find out more at coloplast.com.au. Um, but it's so true. You know, we, we, don't, we don't ask enough. Um, and then the conversations don't don't happen enough. And um, you know, as as someone with a disability and growing up with lived experience, you know, I know that um, it, 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 there is a lack of understanding. You know, with with my vision impairment, as an example, when I was in high school, um, I used to play basketball and rugby um, for the high school, and then I developed cataracts, and the cataracts actually developed on top of what my um, initial uh, condition was from birth. And people couldn't understand why I could go and play rugby league or rugby union and basketball for the school, yet I'd get into the classroom and I couldn't see the blackboard, you know. And so just simple things like that. And I'm sure you have a, a heap of stories about that. But, you know, it's, uh, it's unless you have the conversation, unless you ask the question, you, you don't ever know. And so we would, in, both of us, I think, are encouraging teachers um, to, to engage with students and ask you know, what are the adaptions that are needed, um, talk more about it um, to be able to find good outcomes for people. Yeah, absolutely. I'd prefer someone to ask me a question than assume what I can and can't do. And, yeah, just it for me it's not... Um, it's not embarrassing. It's not, you know, it's not unheard of for you to, to, to do that. I much prefer that. And then, you know, for me, I'm not, I'm not asking because I'm just, you know, super curious or anything like that. I want to learn. I want to find out. I want to be able to understand and, and go there and then, you know, be able to communicate better with you, but to be able to, to, to know, you know, just a little bit. I don't expect to be able to feel the way you are, but, I, you know, I want to be able to try and understand more than anything. Yeah, that's a great point. So um, let's go back to WA. Let's go back to um, where you started. And, and you, you obviously said about eight, you um, started you know, looking at wheelchair sports. Um, and then uh, I read that you, you tried wheelchair basketball. Um, tell me about that experience. Yeah, I did a bunch of sports when I was younger. <laughs> um, obviously, the the athletics, I did track and field. Um, I did the basketball, um, obviously swimming, uh, you know, my first love. Um, but, yes, definitely basketball. I played all through junior years and then um, did some senior basketball as well and then kind of had to say, you know, no, uh, as soon as I got better at wheelchair racing and, you know, I didn't really want to injure myself on the basketball court. But then when I retired, I went back to basketball and played over 10 years of women's league. So 
probably why I'm even a little bit more broken now than I probably was when I was retired. But um, but I love sports so much that yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I won't say I was the best at basketball, but um, I could go down the court fast, but just don't give me the ball. Yeah. Um, Put a blocker, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm just there to get the bigs in the key, and yeah. and uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting though that you know in in, in wheelchair sports. Um, Basketball, I think, has been around, you know, for a long time and a lot of people, yourself and, and people like Dylan Alcott, you know, came into wheelchair sports through basketball um, as a traditional um, sport that, that everyone kind of got to try along the way. Um, you know, so it's, it's interesting. We, we had the same thing in blind sports where um, blind cricket and goalball were traditionally the sports that you played as a young child. And now, you know, there's there's... 10, 15 different sports that you can go and play and try and there's teams for and it's fantastic. But um, just talks about the, I guess, the involvement of, of where things have come from, where there was one team sport option back in those days and then you did swimming or athletics um, as opposed to now where, you know, the world's your oyster. Yeah, there's so many different sports that our guys can th- get involved with. Um, yeah, it's just phenomenal. And, you know, a number of them are Paralympic sports and some of them aren't and that's okay too. Um like I always say that, you know, it doesn't matter you're not, if you don't get to the, the heights of, of representing your country. As long as you're having fun, you're part of a community, you're fit, you're active, you're enjoying it, making new friends, um, learning skills. And a lot of these skills can transfer over into your everyday life and making your everyday life easier. Um, I've seen that through just my coaching and, and it's just phenomenal to see the guys just excel and it doesn't have to be at an elite level. So, yeah, it's it's great. If you're not interested in something, it's the it's the perfect environment to do a come and try. Now, tell me about and, and this is probably the most important thing I think we can talk about today is the confidence that sports given you in the rest of your life. You know, we talk about obviously the physical benefits and uh, and then the social benefits, but um, you know, to be able to look at the rest of your life after you start playing sport and you leave school and you're trying to get a job and trying to build relationships and, and friendships. Tell me the confidence that sport gave you in, in your career as a, as a teenager in WA. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think um, obviously I was involved in sport at a very high level and I had a great support team around me. And then from that sparked so many different things and areas. And I think about my first um you know, interviews for for the media and things like that, you'd get one word out of me. Now you can't shut me up. But um, <laughs> but that confidence and the training that you did and it all made it, um, I suppose, the person you are today. And I've had this amazing platform through sport to be able to, as you said, be an advocate for disability, to get out there and show the world, you know, not necessarily about my disability but my abilities what I could do on the sporting field given the amount of work that I did and how strong I was and fit I was and, you know, to try and make that, I suppose, um, shine through more than my disability. So, yeah, it's definitely shaped me in the person that I've become. Um, I've had so many opportunities through my sporting career um, and, you know, I'm I'm extremely grateful for that um, to be able to do what I'm doing now and still be involved in, in, you know, the love of my life, which is, is definitely sport and wheelchair racing. So um, I'm very thankful and you just never know what's going to come up around the corner. And, you know, my, my parents used to worry about what I was going to do and, you know, I should get a really bit better education and, and all these kind of things in a traditional job. And I'm like, my mom was always, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens kind of thing. <laughs> and thank goodness she did. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's turned out okay. And, you know, I, I, I did go into further studies and I did do a, a bunch of different things. And now I'm working with, you know, one of the, the greatest inter- institutes in, in Australia and um, I have such great support around me and forever learning. You never stop learning as a coach either or as a person. And I have so many opportunities um, for that so yeah the sport has really given me so much growth as a person and you know I'm, I'm very thankful for everything that's opened up to me and the experiences I've had of, of course traveling overseas and seeing the world as well. We'll follow this with part two of the Louise story during the Paralympic Games. In episode two 
um, you'll really hear Louise open up a little bit and we'll discuss um, what having a disability meant, the stereotypes, how she broke them down, uh, her work career and how she's been able to turn what she did and the confidence she gained through sport uh, into her work environment and her employment opportunities. After you listen to our first podcast, we'd love to hear your feedback. So please get in contact with us at Disability Sports Australia through email. You can email us at info at sports, with an S on the end, dot org, dot au, and give us your feedback or post your feedback on our social media platforms where we'll also feature social media posts about upcoming guests on the Breaking Disability podcast. We look forward to engaging with you as our members and our friends and people who are interested in the disability space to be able to learn more about what you want to hear and who you want to hear from. We're excited that this Breaking Disability podcast will not only feature people from sport, but also people from health, education, community and government. It's important that our members and people who are active in the community hear from people who have influence and make decisions, who have had experience through lived experience and also from being involved in different aspects of sport and recreation programming. On behalf of Disability Sports Australia, I'm very privileged to be able to host these shows and to be able to engage. It'd be great to be able to have a good user experience. Thanks again for tuning in to Breaking Disability and to being able to support our initiative to bring more access to you with more information, training and education. Have a great day.